This is Metal Mike, and in this episode, I talk with singer extraordinaire Mats Levin. Mats talks about his new gig singing for Vandenberg and their upcoming album. We also revisit his time with Ingbe Malmsteen and Candle Mask. Hey, make sure you subscribe on YouTube and consider being a paid subscriber through Anchor for $4.99 a month. It's easy. You help keep the podcast going, and in turn, I give you bonus content. There's a link in the description below. Now here's Mats. Check it out. Well, Mats, welcome to the 80s Glam Model Cash, man. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, it's my pleasure, my pleasure. So, hey, big news. You're in Vandenberg now. How did this all come about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it just happened. No, no, but I, I got a, uh, a mail from Adrian probably December last year or something. And, uh, you know, so uh, I actually don't know where he heard me or anything. I'm, I never asked, but... Anyway, he contacted me in December, and uh, we started talking about possible, you know, mm-hmm. collaboration in 2021 to record a new album and everything. So, uh, you know, then it took a while with the pandemic and everything to kind of, for them and the record company, I guess, to kind of decide when to release an album and, and all that, you know. Mm-hmm. So we've been, we've been, we started working on the album maybe two months ago or something, and then we rehearsed for this show as well that we did last week. Awesome. Yeah, you did the first show, and there were some clips of it on Facebook. It sounded great, man. It sounded real good. Yeah, I mean, it was really weird. You know, we never played together live before. He never played with the bass player or the drummer before as well, so this was like the first show. <laughs> <laughs> we rehearsed together for like four, four hours during one day in Holland a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I just flew in and, and did it and flew back again for this time, So because I had another show the day after mm-hmm. in Sweden. So, but you know, we, we we got through it, and it was uh, it was fun, you know. But it, it's weird, to kind of play like a headliner on a festival the first time you see each other on the stage. It's kind of weird, but, but it worked out fine. Everyone, everyone, everyone's been doing this before, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It was cool. It was great. It was interesting too because you guys threw some White Snake tunes in there, and I heard uh, I heard Judgment Day. And I love that song off of uh, Slip of the Tongue, man. And you sounded great. Your your voice really fits the, the White Snake songs. Well, I mean, you know, the first show I saw in my life was the Purple Stormbringer, you know. Oh, wow. Stormbringer tour in 75. So I'm, I'm very much brought up with the whole Deep Purple Rainbow kind of thing in the 80s metal scene and everything. So, sure. you know, it, it kind of comes natural. And, of course, I listened a lot to, to Slip of the Tongue. And those White Snake albums as well at mm-hmm. the time, so so it was just fun to to be able to do it, you know. Are you familiar cool. with um, the Vandenberg uh, songs as well? Yeah, I had the first album when it came out in eighty two, eighty three, mm-hmm. when I was a kid because I, you know, I bought almost everything that came out, you know, that you could read about in the Kerrang magazine <laughs> in the early eighties. <laughs> I subscribed to that magazine. That little town I lived, I was probably the only one who had that magazine. And, you know, I ordered albums from England. And when my parents went to London one time, I told my mother, you got to buy something that I can't buy here in Sweden, you know. And she was like, you know, she went to some record store and she said, yeah, my, my son is a hard rock fan. Do you have anything that is brand new? And she came home with the first Vandenberg album. Oh, that's <laughs> cool. <laughs> and that was like in the late 82 or something. So that's how I got that album. So, uh, yeah. So I've had that one for 40 years, almost. What's um What's Adrian like? Because based on some of the things he posts online, he seems like he's uh, a fun guy. He likes to have fun. Yeah. He's super, you know, he's so down to earth. Such a nice guy. Uh, you know, very, very humble. Very nice, very cool, but very musical and a lot of great ideas. And, uh, you know, he's just the kind of guy who really enjoys playing music and playing with people that just have a smile on their face, you know. He's a very, very down-to-earth guy, and, you know, super nice. And the other guys as well, I mean, actually my experience from working with people from Holland before, and I've been recording in Holland as well before, and it's, they are very natural and loose people, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, everything is very easy going. What's next for you guys? When do you think this album will be out? Well, I'm, I'm kind of waiting for um, the record company to uh, tell us when they will. I would guess, I mean, it will, it will be released next year for sure, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm not sure that they will have time to release it before the summer. So may, maybe a, a song or two will be released before the summer, I would guess, you know, like a couple of singles, and then maybe the album after after next summer. That's my best guess. 
at least. Cool, cool. So you played with a lot of different projects and bands, and, and we'll try to fit as many as we can in here. So let me start, man. I'm just going to throw it out there. <laughs> I'm big into Ingve Malmsteen. Anybody that listens to my uh, podcast know I'm a big Ingve Malmsteen nut. Let's let's start with with Ingve. Um, I love that album, man. Facing yeah. the Animal, great production. You know, it's catchy songs, but yeah. they're they're heavy, but they're melodic. You know, it's, it's just good stuff. What do you think of that one? I think it's, I think um, I was kind of surprised that I was allowed to to co-write as much as I did on the album, mm-hmm. and I think it turned out really really well i mean uh, I, I worked really hard on what i did on the album while i was i was there as well because it was like it was a big gig for me at the time and uh i really wanted to do a, do a good, good impression of course and uh, so we worked pretty hard on it on that album and we had chris sangridis producing as mm-hmm. well and of course cozy powell on drums and yeah. uh it was very inspiring to to work with those people as well. Yeah, that was the first time I had ever heard your voice on anything, and I was blown away because I just, I thought your voice was killer, fit the music really, really well. Well, well, you know, just like you, they, you know, we brought up with the same music. You know, he, mm-hmm. he's like an old Blackmore Purple fan. It was the same for me as well. So, and at the time, I think that he was really he was kind of happy to get like a Swedish guy into the band, or a Swedish singer into the band. Yeah. And he was he was pretty motivated. Uh, with his ideas and everything, so um, yeah, it was it was a good vibe, and on tour as well. So, I mean, it was a, for me it was a great experience, and you know I haven't heard all the albums he's done after that, but I you know I kind of get the feeling that maybe Facing the Animal was the last album that was like hundred percent properly produced by a producer, and right. uh, you know all that stuff. Because uh-huh. after that, kind of I don't know. I think Facing the Animal at least. It, it's a good sounding album, but it's, it's got a couple of really good songs as well. Yeah. One cool one that stands out for the vocal performances is, is Alone in Paradise, man. It's got like a ton of voices. You must have had to overlap yourself uh, quite a few times there. Well, it's not me. That's Jody Turner. <laughs> 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 no, that's, I remember, I think that was like an old idea that Yngwie had from the probably from the Odyssey okay. time. So if I remember right, he already had that title, Alone in Paradise, and he wanted to try that song out again. And I'm almost sure that he had old Jolene Turner backing vocals. And maybe I just copied those and redid them all again. Okay. Uh, it might have been it might have been that I did that. But I remember specifically that that song was, was an old odyssey thing and uh maybe i redid kind of all the back of vocals like joe joe did once or something mm-hmm. it was something like that at least so that was like an old song and it was the same with uh, another time another place as well okay that was like an old song that Ingve never but he didn't have like a melody for it he had the riff but then i tried out you know i did i did the melodies on that one and the lyrics to it and uh suddenly he felt like yeah now it's a cool song you know so so a couple of the ideas were actually old ideas hmm. that's funny because you know i always kind of felt like facing the animal had a little bit of an odyssey vibe you know with like really you know catchy well-written songs yeah. so that's so that's interesting to hear that some of that stuff might have been kicking around from that era oh, that's cool yeah yeah and facing the animal was like a totally different story because i remember Uber had like a a dat tape with a bunch of different riffs and stuff, ideas that he gave to me. And I took that home to Sweden and um, I heard the riffs of Facing the Animal, you know, mm-hmm. and I heard the chorus riff that he had. So I kind of felt pretty, you know, so I came up with the melody and the title and the lyrics for that, for that song. And I came back to the States for the next session and we recorded it. And no one was really super uh, 100% liking it you know Chris Sanguidis was a bit like he didn't know if he was going to use it on the album mm-hmm. while I was like yeah we need a groovy song like this this is cool you know it, it's kind of different from the other songs so we recorded it but I didn't know if it was going to end up in the album or not and then like a month later or something Inve calls me up and he's like yeah I guess we got a name for the album guess what and I was like, yeah it was the name he's facing the animal and I was like wow okay so we're going to use that song yeah it's awesome it's great Okay, cool. <laughs> so that was my lyric and my title, actually. Oh, that's awesome. So, uh, so, so I was really happy that that they actually 
listened a couple of more times to the song, I guess, and, and got the groove and got the, the idea that I had for it. So, so it was cool. Yeah, and it was nice to see him back like on a major label again. And do you think like the label saw something with this collection of songs? Like maybe you know there could be like a, a commercial breakthrough, or, or I know it's tough. It was the '90s, so I, I don't know what was going on with the label. I I wasn't really I wasn't very uh, aware of what was happening with the label or not at all. Actually, I was kind of yeah. Everything happened pretty fast mm -hmm. when it came to me joining and started working on the album. And the only thing I know is that we did that album in the fall of 97. We recorded it. And it was supposed to be released, you know, like uh, after the summer of 97. And then they had this big uh, financial crisis in Southeast Asia. And Japan was a really important market for Ingbe. And they really asked us to to wait with releasing the album and to wait with the tour in Japan because uh, the financial situation for a lot of countries in East, Southeast Asia was, was crap. Mm -hmm. So we, I was actually kind of walking around in Sweden for six months just waiting for the album to get released and for us to, to go out and play on it. So that that's what, what happened uh, in Japan, at least. I know that they they were expecting the album to because it got such good reviews in the mags, they kind of expected that album to, uh, to sell 200,000 copies mm -hmm. uh, to start with, but it sold like 120 or 130,000 copies uh, in Japan. And uh, that was just because of the, of the financial crisis. Oh, sure, sure. Now, your time in the band was, was kind of short-lived. Like a lot of Ingve singers, you know, you just did the one album. Uh, what happened? Was it just a mutual thing? Like it was time to move on? Or what, what happened there? Well, I, you know, I was mostly in contact with Jim Lewis all the time regarding contracts and stuff. And Jim was his manager at the time. And um, I told Jim from the start that I just want to write a contract for one album and uh, one tour to start with, and then we see what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And um, after, after the... When we did the tour in 98, we did a couple of summer shows as well. And uh, then we did release the live album and everything. And I kind of felt that everyone in the band more, more or less wanted to leave the band or wanted to do something else. Mm -hmm. And I also got the vibe that since Inga didn't really uh, sell as much as he normally would have in, in Japan and such, he kind of had to cut the tour short as well mm -hmm. because uh, he didn't have enough money because normally he makes... At the time, at least, he, he made a lot of money in Japan, and he could kind of pay for expenses with that money uh, for certain different other markets where he didn't go uh, plus, so to speak. And uh, so I, I kind of think that when we were going to work on a new album, I kind of knew that I would not have as much input because he wanted to have more publishing on the songs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I felt that several of the guys in the band would not be there either. And uh, so I kind of felt that it would probably not be a, uh, the same kind of situation uh, for the next album. And of course, Cozy died during the time as well. And uh, I was very much like, okay, uh, I did the contract and that was great and that was cool. But, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're all more or less left, I think, expect, except for, for Mats, uh, the keyboard player, maybe. I don't remember. But it was, it was that kind of, it was like a, I never really spoke to Ingve about it. Uh, I more spoke to, to Jim about it, the manager. And everyone was cool about that. You know? It was like, Ingve was so used to have new people all the time anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, it, was, it, it wasn't like anything that, that happened between us or anything like that. It was just like, I kind of felt that this was a great album. It was great doing the tour and everything. It was super cool. But I kind of felt if I do another album, it will probably not be as much fun and I would probably not have as much input either. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, of course, what happened later on as well. That Ingo wanted to take care of all the songwriting to make more punching money, I guess, and stuff. Yeah, I understand. So you spent time, a lot of time, in Candlemas, uh, you know, which is a lot different than things that people usually expect from you. But I watched one of the concerts, man, you did with uh, the Wacken. It yeah. sounded great, man. I mean, it sounds awesome. Like you, it definitely fits. Yeah. Well, like the thing is that I was brought up with more of the purple style and everything, but like in the mid '90s, I did 
I did an album with Leif Edling, uh, who's like the, the leader of Canamass. We did an album called Abstract Algebra, and that was like a doom, like an industrial doom album. And that was the first time I did something that was a bit darker mm-hmm. and uh, more aggressive. And I can't, I can't really like that. That was like two. That was actually the album that made Inve call me because Inve heard that album. Wow. Uh, and then after the Inve period, I started to work with Leif again on another project called uh, Crux. And we released three albums of Crux. Uh, and the last one was right before I kind of started playing with Canamask. So I had, um, I kind of had discovered a side of myself that really liked uh, the heavier, doomier stuff, which wasn't weird either because I listened to a lot of Black Sabbath when I was a kid as well. You know, mm-hmm. I was brought up with both Black Sabbath and Purple and all that stuff. So, so um, yeah, so I really enjoyed being a part of Canamass as well. Um, and to me, of course, Canamass was more like more of a band to me compared to, for instance, uh, Inve, which is more like a session job, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was the, the Candle Mass fan base, were they receptive to you? Did, did they accept you as the singer? Uh, well, that was the thing that it was in 2012 that Candle Mass uh, stopped working with Rob Lowe, the previous singer. And the thing is that I had kind of been, I had been involved with Candle Mass for many years in the background. I helped them make demos and do backing vocals sometimes and stuff. Uh, and they had asked me already in 2008 if I wanted to join them. We kind of agreed on me not doing it because I felt you can't change singers so much. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta try to stick with Robert here and see if you can work it out. But then they couldn't work it out with Robert in 2012. So they asked me if I could do three shows, like three festivals. And uh, I said, okay, I can do that. And uh, then, of course, they booked more shows. And I said all the time that I don't really want to join the band right now. Because I kind of feel that the fans, they would probably just feel that I'm just another singer again. And, you know, I already worked with Leif on other projects before. And I, I just felt that maybe you should just wait with deciding on who's going to be your new singer, you know. Uh, so it wasn't until 2015, actually, that we went out and said, OK, uh, I'm the off- new official singer of Cannabis. And during that time, during those years, between 2012 and 2015, I could tell that both the journalists and the fans accepted me when it came to singing the old songs and everything. Mm -hmm. But I also felt that if I had went out already in 2012 and and saying, hey, I'm the new singer of Canamas, maybe the fan base wouldn't have liked me. You know, it's it's, it's a bit of a a a psychological thing. People kind of, they listen with different ears, depending on if you're just a, a guy coming in helping out for a while, you know, compared to uh, going out saying that mm. he's the new new frontman or the new singer. So, um, so the fan base was really acknowledged that liking what I did. At the same time, you always have people that like Messiah the most, or they like you, Joe Wan the most, or the mm. first album or whatever. And that's cool, you know. I'm I like Messiah most myself, you know. <laughs> I, was, I always thought that they should have Messiah on vocals. <laughs> so. Uh, that's why I didn't. That's why I didn't join in 2008 because I was like, "Fuck, guys, you got to make your mind up here," you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, let's talk about Skyblood, man. So this is like your project. Like you're you're in control of this project. I checked this out last night, man. It sounds great, and uh, I really the song that really stood out was the "Not Forgotten." Really, really cool song. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. So tell everybody yeah. about that. It's a really, really cool album. Well, the thing is that many of those songs. Uh, are like songs I started writing many, many years ago. But I, it was like a combination of bad self-confidence and no time to kind of complete it and, and release it. And I was always like, I wasn't really interested in releasing the album on some small label or by myself. I was like, I'd rather wait until the right opportunity comes when I can actually release it on a proper label. And I can feel myself that I'm really, really 100% happy with it as well. And um, so I started recording the drums for most of those songs already like six years ago or something uh, with uh, different guys on drums. But I never really completed uh, the songs. But then after Canamas in 2018, because Canamas uh, were on Napalm Records. So like the day after we split with Canamas, I, I did like a Facebook post about 
new songs I was working on or whatever. And then I got like a mail from Napalm Records who didn't know about this. And they asked me, hey, do you have any demos you can send us or whatever? And I did. And like a couple of days later, I had the, record, the contract with Napalm. Oh, wow. Which was great because that, that really kicked me in the ass to, to complete the album, you know. And I had a lot of, you know, I had a lot of hunger to do that after the Canamass thing. And a lot of drive to really, to really finish the album. So that was great. So uh, that was released like in late 2019, that album. And of course, I was hoping to book festivals for 2020 and start doing that as well. But, but then the pandemic happened and all that. So, so uh, I didn't really. So I pretty soon I was like, OK, I, I might as well do another album and see if I can do some shows after that album instead, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, so the way it is now is that I, I have songs for the next album. I just haven't kind of really recorded them yet. I recorded drums on half of the songs. But, you know, there's, a, there's always new stuff happening as well, like now with Adrian. So uh, I'm focusing on that. So Sky Blood is just like a heart. It's very close to my heart, and it's like my own project. I do everything myself. I write everything. I produce it. And I play a lot of the instruments as well. So, so it's, it's a really fun thing, too, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy and proud about it. That's awesome, man. And one album that really caught my eye out of your catalog was Swedish Erotica, man. That's that's just straight up hair model. That's that's perfect for the eighties glam model cast, man. That sounded great. Absolutely absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that was my first album. That was the first album I did. And that was on Virgin Records here in Sweden. And um I remember we were so we were so disappointed because Virgin America was thinking of like bringing us over to the States and, you know, that we would be like one of their hair metal bands or whatever mm-hmm. that they would promote. But they chose another band called Rock's Gang instead. Yep, yep. Um, so, uh, and then we, then we had problems with the distribution in Sweden for the album. And, uh, they went bankrupt, and so our albums didn't get out to the customers for a while. It was a bit chaotic. But it was a great, for me, it's a great memory. And I'm still friends with several of the guys in the band as well. So that was my first real album that I got out to tour with in Sweden as well. And we went to the UK as well. So, yeah, Swedish Rodicum. Well, hey, it's been great talking with you. What would you want to say to all your fans out there who've been following you all these years? Oh, well, just hope that you continue to uh, <laughs> to listen to what I do, you know. And I think I think people will appreciate the Vandenberg album. I hope that it will be like a cross between you know, Vandenberg and a bit of what Adrian did with White Snake as well, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe like one or two of those more epic songs. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to completing that. So I hope people like it. Great, man. Well, Hey, it's been great talking with you. Thanks for all the great music and uh, you have a great day, man. Uh, Thanks, man. Thanks for talking to me. Well, that was a cool chat talking with Max. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Rock on!